Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ben Darnell, the uh, co-founder and chief architect here at Cockroach Labs. And uh, today I'm here to talk about uh, foreign key constraints and transaction isolation levels. All right, I've said six words and already see a little yawning, so uh, let's, uh, let's liven things up a little bit. All right. All right, so this, this of course is Van Halen, the uh, iconic rock band of the uh, 70s and 80s. And uh, they were known for putting on these absolutely massive shows in huge, uh, huge arenas with uh, you know, loud music, lights, pyrotechnics, everything. And uh, before they could put on one of these shows, they would need to have a, a contract signed with the, uh, with the venue where they were going to perform. These contracts would run for more than 50 pages and uh, specify absolutely everything that the band needed to, uh, to put on the, so the show successfully. Everything from the electrical requirements for their amplifiers and lights to the, uh, just the amount of weight that the stage needed to be able to support during the show. Um, and somewhere in this contract, they would put a, uh, put, put a funny little uh, rule that said that in the band's dressing room, there had to be a, uh, a bowl of M&M candies with all of, the, uh, all of the brown ones removed. Now, why, would they, uh, why did they do this? Did someone just really hate the taste of brown M&Ms, or maybe they're allergic to the dye? Um, no, it was actually a test of the venue's attention to detail. Because they knew that if they got to the venue and they saw brown M&Ms in their dressing room, they needed to go back and scrutinize everything else um, that was going on because they didn't want the show to be interrupted because, were, uh, because they were going to overload the circuit breaker or even the, uh, the stage might, uh, might collapse if they, uh, if they put too much weight on it. And so they, they knew that if they, uh, if they saw that the, that the venue wasn't able to handle this simple task of, uh, of getting, the, uh, get, getting their snack order correct, that they wouldn't be able to do the, uh, the much more complicated task of, uh, of supporting the, uh, the, the rest of the show. So what does this have to do with databases? Well, we have a feature in, uh, in relational databases that I think serves a very similar role to the, uh, to, to the, uh, the Brown M&M &M rule. Um, and that feature is uh, foreign key constraints. So um, first, I'm going to give you a little, uh, little refresher on what exactly foreign key constraints are and then how they, uh, how they relate to, uh, to, to uh, the brown M&M problem. So this is an example of a foreign key um, extracted, uh, simplified from the uh, TPCC benchmark. Um, we have uh, two tables, order and order line. This is a standard pattern in SQL for, uh, for doing a one-to-many relationship. So we have uh, an order which uh, conceptually contains multiple order line, uh, line items, and those line items each refer back to their, uh, to their parent order record. Um, so this is a foreign key, and this is, uh, this is something that exists in the, uh, in the schema, um, kind of whether you tell the database about it or not. If you have a, a, a column in one table that refers to a column in another table, that's a foreign key relationship between those two tables. Um, but usually when we talk about foreign keys in SQL, we talk about foreign key constraints. Um, a foreign key constraint is when you tell the database that this foreign key exists and you want it to enforce certain rules about it. So this is uh, an alter table statement that does uh, add constraint uh, foreign key uh, order ID references orders dot order ID or orders per in order ID, um, and this tells the database that this foreign key relationship exists and that it needs to do extra work to enforce the enforce this constraint. So what does that uh, what does that extra work mean? It uh, it checks when you insert into the order line table. It checks that the corresponding record in the orders table exists. And when you delete or update the orders table, it checks that, uh, that if you're changing, the, uh, changing that uh, order, line, order ID primary key, that, the, uh, that there are no, um, no order line records that are going to be left behind in this transition. So this is, uh, th this is nice. It helps you avoid um, orphaned records in the order line table. But it also, it also comes at a cost. Um, the database, database has to do extra work to verify that this, uh, that this constraint is upheld. Um, this, uh, this performance cost is so well known that uh, many uh, Many developers and many, uh, many companies have a policy of, uh, of never using foreign key constraints. Um, and uh, in fact, that's, uh, that, that's kind of the position that I, uh, that I started from. In all of my career before working at Cockroach Labs, I, uh, I, I never, uh, never worked in, a, in an environment where, uh, where foreign keys were used. Um, and I never really saw bugs that would have been prevented if we had been using them. So you know, I think that uh, you know, with foreign keys uh, being a, a, fairly weak, uh, a fairly weak check, you don't get a lot of value for the, uh, for the extra work that you're asking the database to do and that extra performance requirements. Um, but um, on the other hand, there are other things you could be, uh, there, there are other bugs that I have seen that could have been pre prevented with more application level checks that rely on the same, um, on the same transactional mechanisms as foreign key constraints. So let's, uh, let's walk through some examples to show what I mean. These are going to be some examples of different, uh, different transactions running in a, in a database with, uh, with, with uh, various constraints that we want to enforce. 
So if you've got a foreign key constraint, um, it's great. It's very simple. You don't have to do anything specifically. You just insert into the order line table. Um, and, uh, and as long as the, uh, as long as the, uh, the, the right record exists, then, uh, the, then the, the database will, will enforce this for you automatically. Um, but let's suppose for a second that you, don't, uh, that you don't have foreign key support in your database or you're not using it, but you want to have the same effect. You can do the same thing that the database does for its, uh, for its foreign key constraints um, by uh, just manually adding an extra, an extra select statement into your, um, into, your, uh, into your transaction. So this is uh, essentially doing, uh, doing a, a foreign key check uh, manually. You start, th start your transaction by selecting from the orders table. You see, the, see whether or not the, uh, the record you want exists. And uh, if so, you can proceed. If not, you, uh, you abort and roll back the transaction. Um, and so this is, this is just checking for existence. It's a pretty weak check. And as I said, it's not, uh, it's not the kind of thing that I see, uh, that I see uh, coming up in practice very often. Although I did learn yesterday from, uh, from Jeff, uh, Jeff's talk from, uh, from ShopMonkey that uh, in multi-region applications in CockroachDB, uh, using, doing this uh, existence check with the uh, CardiB uh, region column can be a, a useful, uh, useful use of foreign keys. Um, but overall, it's a fairly, uh, fairly weak check. Um, when I look back at my career and the kinds of bugs that I have, uh, that I have seen that I wish I could have prevented at the, uh, at the database level, it's really something more um, that's happening more at the application level. So, um, for example, consider um, if you have a, uh, if you have a, a tab in, uh, a, a, one browser tab open where you're checking out and another tab where you're adding an item to your shopping cart, um, the database has to make sure that, uh, that you can't add, uh, add an item to your shopping cart at the same time that you're checking out and then maybe get that added to the order and, uh, you, you know, after the, the total was being calculated but before the, uh, the order is processed. So you want to make sure that the, uh, that the order is in the, is in the right state to, be, uh, to, to receive a new, uh, a, new line, a new order item added. So you can do that um, if you're, uh, it, with, a, with an extra, um, extra step in your manual query. You can do whatever, whatever application level constraints you want. So here, for example, I've added uh, an and status equals open uh, clause to the, to the query. And so this lets me say that I want to add, uh, add this order line only if the, uh, if the corresponding order is still in the open status and not in the uh, you know, fulfilled or, uh, or canceled status. Um, and so this, um, this is something that is, uh, that is going to work um, if and only if a foreign key constraint would work. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's enforcing a much higher level um, application uh, level invariant instead of just the, uh, the existence or non-existence of a row like the, like the database can do by itself. So this relies on the same, uh, on the same transactional mechanisms as foreign key constraints. Let's go, let's go a little deeper on what those transactional mechanisms are. Um, so we've had this, uh, this transaction up on the screen for, uh, for a couple minutes now, um, but uh, I wanna step back and ask, uh, ask a very basic question. Does this even work? Is it doing the, is it doing the right thing, uh, transactionally speaking? And uh, the answer is, um, as, it, as it often is in these kinds of things, it depends. Um, this transaction, as written here, is, uh, is safe if you're using serializable isolation. So uh, I'm showing the, uh, so, so I've added a, a, another concurrent transaction here showing an update to the, uh, to the orders to, uh, to set the status as, as paid. This uh, simulates the effect of, uh, of you know, checking out in, uh, in another browser window, um, and here, um, if, these, uh, if that update statement were to happen in between the select and the insert, we would have an inconsistency because we would, uh, we, we would lose the, uh, we would be able to insert, uh, insert a new order line into an order that's already, uh, already been paid. And so this is, uh, this would be a problem if it would happen, but in serializable isolation, the database guarantees that that, uh, that, that never happens. Uh, serializable isolation means that the database ensures that everything happens as if only one transaction is running at a time, and so either the update happens before the select and insert, or the select and insert happens before the update, but you never get the update happening in the middle of the, uh, of the select and insert, changing the, uh, changing the state of the world. And this is why in, uh, in CockroachDB, we've always emphasized uh, serializable transactions as the, uh, as the default and most important mode of isolation, because this is, uh, th this is where transactions really work with, uh, as you expect without any, uh, without any surprises. But uh, of course, uh, other databases exist that, uh, that don't, uh, don't use serializable isolation by default. Uh, as Nate just told us, uh, CockroachDB is adding support for read committed isolation um, in our next release. So how does this work if you're not running a serializable transaction? Well, you have to do uh, a little bit of the database's work for it. Um, you have to do some explicit locking to tell the, tell the database that you need, uh, you, you need this uh, data that you've read to not change. So in, uh, in Postgres, this is done with the, uh, with the for share clause on the, uh, on the, uh, on the select statement, um, or some other variants like for key share, uh, depending on, uh, on exactly what, uh, what, what, your, what your needs are. So we take our, take our select statement, we add uh, the for share clause to say that we want to, uh, to block other writes to this column or th this row, but not, uh, but not other reads. 
And so with this, uh, with this clause added, um, we've done a little bit of the database's work for it, but we have, um, we, we, we've, uh, we've guaranteed that even in, uh, in, in read committed isolation that we're going to get the right results. Um, because now if that, uh, if that update comes along after our select statement, it's going to have to wait to acquire the lock that we, uh, that we got with our, uh, with our for share statement. So where this starts to get complicated though is that uh, in uh, a lot of the distributed database systems, this uh, for share clause that you see in, uh, in uh, monolithic database systems like, uh, like Postgres or most, uh, most existing uh, SQL databases, um, it may not be available. Um, or maybe you're, maybe you're sharding your database manually, and uh, if, the, if, a, if a record is, a, is across on another shard, maybe you're not allowed to, do, uh, to, to get, that, uh, get that kind of lock. Or maybe getting, uh, getting that lock turns you uh, from a fast single shard transaction into a, uh, into a slow distributed transaction, and that may, uh, may, may give up a lot of the, uh, the performance that you would hope to gain by using these, uh, th these distributed uh, architectures. For example, a lot of, a lot of sharded, uh, sharded databases or sharded sharding systems um, just won't let you do uh, do foreign key constraints unless you can um, unless you can prove that the uh, that the data is going to be on the same shard um, through other uh, through other means. That's a red flag. So that's uh, you know just like the uh, just like the uh, brown M and M's in the dressing room. If the database says that you can't use foreign key constraints in this situation, that's really a, a, a warning sign that there's there's other things that you may want to do that may be more important that are not going to be available to you. So in conclusion, if you don't like to use foreign key constraints, you're in good company. But if a database doesn't even give you that option, that's a big red flag. And if you're the kind of person who would pick through a bowl of M&Ms because every detail has to be right, CockroachDB is the database for you. Thank you.